Hello, welcome to this, our uh, fourth meeting of the Free Enterprise Society for the semester. And um, my name is Steve Trost. I'm the director of the Institute for the Study of Free Enterprise here at Oklahoma State University. I'm also the uh, faculty uh, advisor for the Free Enterprise Society. So today we have uh, Dr. Jay Richards, who's going to be talking about uh, artificial intelligence and human intelligence. And um, and then we'll uh, then we'll do some Q and A. So uh, Dr. Richards is a research assistant faculty at uh, the Bush School of Business at Catholic University. He's a uh, senior research fellow at the Heritage Foundation uh, and a senior fellow at Discovery Institute. He's author of, of numerous books, uh, and this is this is one. Um, so we'll be talking about this tonight. Uh, tomorrow over lunch. Uh, we'll have a small group discussion uh, talking about uh, the topic. And then for the next four weeks on Mondays over lunch, we'll do a book study uh, on the book. So if you're interested in, uh, in what you hear uh, and you want to uh, dig in a little deeper, uh, so Mondays uh, for the next four weeks, we'll study it together. So if you will please welcome Dr. Richards. Uh, Great to be with you all. I'm actually born and raised in Amarillo, Texas, and but I had never been to OSU, so I had some friends that went here. Always heard it was a really nice campus. And I can't figure out, I was asking Steve why you guys have all these nice red brick buildings, because in Amarillo, all the brick is yellow, the dullest possible brick, because that's the color of the dirt. So be thankful that you're on a sort of beautiful campus here. Uh, well, I want to give you a kind of once over lightly, and I, I promise this is not going to be a sort of technical uh, scientific or engineering talk. What I want, I want to do tonight is I want to help you understand at a kind of the high level this basic debate that um, you'd be surprised how raging this debate is. The reason I wrote the book is honestly because I was really frustrated by the way in which uh, the conversation was going. So let me sort of summarize for you really quickly almost the entire literature about smart machines and artificial intelligence in the future of work, all right? So this is my 30-second summary of the entire literature. There's a dystopian side, which is the sort of, this is really depressing, and there's a utopian side, and those are the two sides of the debate. So here's the, the, the dystopian side, is that sometime in the next 10 to 20 years, about half of all jobs will be made obsolete by a combination of robotics and automation and artificial intelligence. Because humans get their meaning in life in part from their work and from their productive capacity, people are gonna be really depressed and they're not gonna have jobs, so we need a universal basic income to, to pay everyone because they're not gonna have any jobs, all right? So that's, that's the dystopian side. Here's the utopian side is sometime in the next 10 to 25 years, half of all jobs are gonna become obsolete. They're gonna be replaced by artificial intelligence, smart uh, computers, and robotics. And it's gonna be awesome, because we can just party all night and sleep all day, and we're not gonna to have to work, because the machines are gonna do it all for us. All right, that's literally the debate. And now, I think that actually both of those are dystopian. And the reason is because, I, imagine this, it's sort of at the extreme, right? So imagine a scenario in which there's literally no productive thing that human beings are needed to do. So all of our food, all of our structures, all of our art, all of our music, everything that you can think of for us to do is actually done by machines. Can anybody think of a, a movie in the last, say, 12 years where this actualized? It's an animated film. Any, anyone remember where this happened? Wally, -E. -E, right? Okay, was that a utopia? Do you remember those folks up, up in the, the, the ch floating chase lounges, remember? And they were so sedentary that their bones didn't even connect, right? That, that actually, I think it was a sort of deeply correct view anthropologically of the truth is that human beings, if you just look at our bodies, if you look at the ways in which we find fulfillment, if you read happiness studies, you will discover that even though economists treat work as if it's a bad, in the sense that if we could substitute leisure for work, we would always do that, that's not actually true. Um, if you see a movie, another movie from the 1960s, which I'm not recommending, but I'm just referencing it, called The Graduate uh, with, um, with Dustin Hoffman. 
And he spends a summer after his graduation uh, living a sinful lifestyle, let's say, and then all day just floating in the pool. And he ends up in complete despair in about 12 weeks. Right? That tells you something about the nature of the human person uh, is that, yes, we work often, and for most of human history, people worked because they had to by necessity. Nevertheless, if we only worked by necessity, then why don't people quit working so hard after they reach, say, $75,000 in income? Right? You, if this were true, if work were a bad, the more money you made, the less you would work. Right? In fact, that's what economists predicted in the middle of the 20th century. John Maynard Keynes, the famous uh, uh, economist of uh, Keynesian fame, predicted that your generation would work 15 hours a week because of automation. So he assumed, right, that 35 of our hours uh, would be done by machines, and so we would only have to work 15 hours. Uh, I actually think that's itself a dystopian vision. And so I, my sense, I'm just gonna give you my bias, is that if it were true, that machines literally did everything that we were doing in the past, that would be a bad thing, even if we had all of our sort of basic needs met, our, our health care and our uh, uh, medicine and, and food and shelter and all those kinds of things. So that's the kind of background. But I don't actually think, that, I don't think either of these scenarios is true, but I want to give the devil his due in the sense that, in other words, I want to concede all the sort of true parts of this argument, but I don't actually agree with either side of the literature on this. What, what's presupposed by both sides? Remember I described a utopian side and a dystopian side, but what did they agree was going to happen? What's the thing that they hold in common? Yeah, that most of our jobs are going to, not only that, not, not just that our jobs are going to be replaced by machines, but that we are. That's the crucial, that's the crucial sort of connection that I want you to see being made, because that's actually the, the kind of illicit intellectual move that's made. Because what's actually happening here, what happens in the, the let's just call this the smart machines debate, or the artificial intelligence debate, or the, the robotics debate, is that certain assumptions certain philosophical assumptions and certain assumptions about the nature of human beings get smuggled in. So what you think you're actually, you're having a conversation about technology and engineering and robotics and computing, when in fact what's happening is a particular vision of the nature of the human person and the nature of technology, it gets snuck in but never really argued for. And so those are always the dangerous things in, in the world of ideas. Uh, the thing that the person's arguing for explicitly, right, you know it's there. And so you're, you're on your guard if you're disagreeing with it. It's the assumptions that are not defended but get smuggled in that you have to be on the lookout for. And that's absolutely the case in this debate. All right, well, but let's, let's at least talk for a minute about this basic reality. Why is it that so many technologists, and I could spend a bunch of time, if you read my book, I, I quote uh, various uh, you know, officially smart people on this, whether it's uh, uh, McKinsey or you know, uh, uh, the Future of Work group at Oxford University or whatever, and they all sort of agree on this. And the reason they generally think that the work that we're now doing is going to become obsolete is because of genuine technology trends, stuff that's actually happening. So when I was working on the book, the book came out um, in 2018, and I had to kind of make some predictions. Um, and what's funny was in the book, I was sort of skeptical because people were already telling us that in 2020, we were going to have fully autonomous cars. In fact, Elon Musk was saying that, right, about his Teslas, that this was gonna happen. Uh, Uber was saying this, and so in, actually in, in 2017, the Uber Corporation, so this is an XC90, a Volvo XC90. Um, and so all the companies, uh, Google and um, Microsoft, several companies are in the space trying to develop autonomous cars. But as you can guess, a lot of cities have laws that prevent this, right? So it's generally against the law to have a car driving around on the streets that, without a driver in it. It turns out there, there are laws against that sort of thing. And so some cities thought, well, we'll get ahead of the curve here. We'll change our laws to make autonomous vehicles legal, at least under certain 
situations. And Pittsburgh is one of the, the cities that did that. And so as a result, there's a fleet of these Volvo XC90s floating around and they're part, partnered with Uber uh, and driving around Pittsburgh and you can see those. If you're in, in Washington DC where I am, there's another company that's doing this. Not Probably three or four days goes by that I don't see a car like this. And so what you're seeing is LiDAR and it's got infrared and there's all these kinds of things so that it's the, these cars are using the networks that are available, so they're using GPS, they're using whatever your travel app, right, that you would use. It, it has access to that, but it also has a bunch of kind of local sensors, right? So it's tr making a 3D image of everything that's happening, all the motion. Um, it's communicating where it can with other cars. So it's doing things that we can't do, right? We're just look at, sort of looking ahead and maybe looking in the mirrors. We don't have a 3D image all the way around us. That's what these cars are doing. And then it's also do using what's called machine learning. So these cars are get using data, right? So it's, it's not that these have been pre-programmed because the init initial problem was that people realized there's, there's actually no way to be able to program a car ahead of time to anticipate every possible thing that could happen. If you actually actually write the code for that, it's never going to happen. But this was the breakthrough in, in machine learning is that what you do uh, is you, you develop a machine that then records the things that are happening around it and records the human inputs. And so if you look at these cars in Washington DC right now, or you look at them in Pittsburgh, they're not autonomous. They're being driven by someone every time. And now why are they doing that? Well, they're essentially trying to train the algorithm so that what the algorithm does is it records, a, it's a person driving, and if he or she's a good driver, if you stop at a red light, it's gonna record, oh, you generally stop at a red light, right? You, green light, you go, um, and it records all this. Now, that sounds like a kind of slipshod way of doing this, but multiply this by dozens of cars over millions of miles recording all of this activity of intelligent agents, right? Ch making these choices, and then the machines recording that, and then sorting the choices to discover the underlying patterns of what people do. And you might say, well, now that sounds somewhat imperfect, right? Because there's gonna be some scenario that the uh, car is gonna eventually encounter. That's true. But here's the key thing, is it only, it doesn't have to be perfect. It just needs to be as good as the average driver, right? And that that's a fairly low bar, right? I've got a, I have a daughter that's a, a freshman in college, um, and I worry about this because she's a good driver, but you know, she's, come on, she's like you guys, right? I mean, most of you have not been driving for very long, and so that's the kind of key thing is you don't need a car that's, so, uh, that's perfect, you just need a car that's safer than the average driver. And so once you have autonomous cars that can do that, then all of a sudden, right, because of machine learning, because remember, you, basically once you program one, you can program all of them in this way. And so that's what's happening when you see these semi-autonomous cars driving around, is that they're kind of autonomous, but what they're really doing is that they're gathering the data from what we do to be able to kind of program themselves, if we want to speak metaphorically. So that's what's happening. So imagine what, you know, 10 years ago or so, so I first drove Uber. Do you guys have Uber? Is there Uber in Stillwater? Um, and so for it to, the business model requires a certain kind of population size. And because there's a university here, you would have it. But like a lot of small towns, you know, I discovered this to my chagrin, I'll fly in somewhere. And you can always get an Uber from an airport to someplace else. But if you go out somewhere, right, then you can't get back because there are no Uber cars. But in DC, we had them in 2012. And so they're absolutely everywhere. And the first thing they did is displaced cab drivers, right? And the cab drivers in a lot of places, the cabs are, um, they're basically monopolies effectively. And so in the Dulles Airport in Washington, DC, there's something called the Washington Flyer. And it's a total racket. And so you had to take this cab from Dulles Airport, you can only use Washington Flyer and they have some kind of fee. So if another yellow cab wants to show up, he gets charged so much, it's not worth it, right? And so they tried to do that. And so what happened is that the Uber drivers, they, it was sort of a weird sort of thing because it wasn't a cab. And there can't be laws against people picking you up at the airport, right? And so what this new technology did is it sort of worked between the seams of the regulations so that people that would make the laws and regulations in Washington, D.C. started using Uber and got used to it before they realized that it undercut 
the cabs, because if they had thought of that ahead of time, they'd have come up with some regulation to make it illegal. But the people who have made it Ill illegal got used to driving Ubers, right? It's an awesome business model, right? And so this is what happened. And so a lot of cab drivers got displaced. But you know what a lot of them did? So the, the Washington Flyers, those guys are almost all guys that drive the Washington Flyers for whatever reason. I assume they probably don't let women drive or something. It's that much of a racket that I can almost imagine that. Uh, but they would moonlight with Uber and Lyft, right? And so all of a sudden, you've got something that's it's undercut. And the reason is because it's a much better system. Right? So you don't have to go out and hail a cab. You don't have to sort of shop from this one person. It's, it connects you because of the information directly to a car and the drivers are bidding with each other, right? And so it's a superior technology. And so this has completely transformed the landscape in at least in the cities around the country. It's transformed uh, uh, taxi service. Now it has, you wouldn't say, that's not exactly replaced jobs because a lot of the people that might otherwise be driving cabs, right, are now driving Ubers or driving Lyfts. So what happens, though, when those people uh, are replaced by these Ubers and they're genuinely autonomous, so there's no one driving it? Now, that hadn't happened, and it's a much, much harder nut to crack than most of the enthusiasts will tell you. What's happening is, what they're discovering is it's, it's gotten fairly easy to get about 95% of the way there and 96% of the way there but getting to 100% where you're willing to let a car drive around on the city, you know, in a city, um, that is really, really, really tough. But let's just assume that it's going to happen. Let's assume it's going to happen in the next five years, right? Then that's actual jobs that people were doing that are no longer being done, right? So this is, this is where these predictions come from. So I want you to sort of appreciate that. That's a real case in which a particular job gets replaced by a technology. Now here's a much more significant one, autonomous trucks. So before I was in DC, we lived in Seattle for, for years. And for me, we, this, when we first, I first, first started thinking about this issue, I was in Seattle and I thought, there is just no way we're ever gonna get cars driving around in Seattle. First of all, there's random people wandering into the streets and it's rainy and there are potholes. It's just, it's a disaster. But highways are a different matter entirely. Right? There's particular standards for interstates. They're basically straight. They don't have intersections. They just sort of go. Right? And so this is actually much, much easier to do. Developing an long, autonomous long-haul truck, that part of it is actually pretty easy to do compared to a cab driving around in a city. Moreover, this is a really, really significant source of employment. In fact, in Western states, long-haul trucking is the number one job for men in about, about a half a dozen Western states. So not the majority of jobs, but if you were to list the jobs that had the most people, right, it's, it's long haul trucking. So this is tens of thousands of decent jobs that could, within a decade, cease to exist. And most long haul truckers have invested in their truck, right? So they've actually got major capital investment in this, and what happens when it's suddenly obsolete? This is a, this is a Tesla, uh, truck that's being uh, tested right now by Walmart. Now, it might be that you still need one person, but let's say you need one driver that's sort of uh, overseeing 10 trucks that are otherwise autonomous and from point to point. You can see how you've got machines doing things that were previously had to be done by human beings. I don't know if any of you have ever toured a, um, an Amazon fulfillment center. Uh, you don't have to, though. You can actually just go to YouTube and you can look at the video. So you don't have, but you can, they, you can tour them if you ask. But let me tell you what they look like. This is, this is an inside view. So uh, there's a company called Kiva, which is a robotics, a factory robotics company. And you see them here. You see the little orange things in the, the upper right there? They look like Roombas, you know, those little vacuum cleaners? They're, they're like giant Roombas, but they're essentially forklifts. And so what these do is they, they are autonomous, they're programmed, but they're not on tracks, they're on wheels, and they move around in these fulfillment centers and they take the pallets and they move them around. And so what would have 10 years ago required a forklift driver, and forklift driving, by the way, that's a, that's a genuine skill. 
it's way, it's way beyond just hitting a, a nail with a hammer. It's something you know, that takes some skill. Those don't exist in Amazon fulfillment centers. There aren't any forklifts. There are these, these robots, right? And so those are the orange ones that move things around. And then there's the yellow ones that are fixed arm robots that can lift entire pallets and they can do it much, much faster than any person with a machine could do. And Amazon realized, okay, this is the future. And so guess what they did? They bought Kiva, right? This is what Amazon does. Okay, we're gonna need a lot of these, so let's just buy the company, right? But they still painted them this way. But there are still some humans in the Amazon fulfillment center. So you see this woman here, right? Now, do you notice what she's doing? Is she moving a pallet? No, is she driving a truck? No, is she, is she running that robot? No, she's literally taking something, I can't tell what it is, maybe it's an iPad or something. She's taking it out of a bin and believe it or not, putting it in a box. Now, they, they, Amazon, this is called the picking problem in robotics. So this is a weird thing, is it's actually, it's easy, we have a, it's an easy to build a robot that can lift something that's 500 pounds and to do it over and over and over and over again, right? Because you can program it for it's this particular thing, it's this particular weight, so it needs to have this amount of pressure, and it moves along this particular uh, trajectory over and over and over again. We can't quite build robots yet that can do anything that the average three-year-old can do. That's what's weird. And so for instance, I can now, I'm not an average three-year-old, I'm a little spastic, but I'm gonna to try to do this, right? But notice, I picked this up, right? And now, um, I, I knew about how much this weighed. I know how hard it is. I could have squeezed it, right, sort of stupidly, like Superman, you know, and squirted the Coke out, but I knew that. There's all this complex feedback calculation going on here based upon my memory, my knowledge of what this is, its size, how hard it is, the fact that the can is open right, how much it weighs so I didn't overcompensate or anything like that. And we all learn to do this, right? If we, you know, basically, if our limbs work, we all learn to do this. And this is a remarkably difficult thing to capture with robotics. And so this is why, if you think about it, there's some amazing things that we've gotten machines to do. 1995, the greatest chess player in the world was bested by an IBM computer. Way back in 1995, chess, which is tough. Have you ever seen Rosie the robot housekeeper? No, we can't do that. We don't know how to make robots that can do all these kind of diverse things. And so what you might think when you first start thinking about smart machines is that all the manual labor is going to disappear. In fact, there's certain kinds of manual labor that involve complex uh, movements of our body that are the toughest things to capture. Intellectual things, financial calculations, even writing of financial reports, alas. If you're thinking about doing financial reporting, I wouldn't go into that, incidentally. <laughs> you know, we've already got uh, algorithms that are getting good at that. And so this is these kind of weird factors. Now, will this always be true? Will Amazon always need machines the entire process until the very last minute, there'll need to be a person standing there to get stuff out of a box or off the bin and to put it in a box. Probably not. In fact, Amazon right now is uh, sponsoring these things uh, called picking challenges. And so they're teams. In fact, if any of you involved in robotics, this would be a way to make a name for yourself, is different people are trying to figure out, okay, how do we develop robots that can pick up every darn thing that Amazon sells and put it accurately into a box? because that's the trick. This would have been easy if they'd stuck with books, but now they sell literally everything. And so being able to do what an ordinary human being does, this has been a tough challenge. I would predict that in the next five years, though, they're gonna more or less solve this problem. And then those remaining jobs will also disappear. Right? So what might, you might be imagining 30 years ago, there would have been conveyor belts and people driving forklifts and moving pallets around, and so there's some jobs disappeared. And then the last remaining jobs that require, you know, the manually dexterous people to, to put stuff into boxes, those disappear. All right, so this is, I, I want you to get a sense for why people would predict this. Now, what's this weird problem uh, with the picking challenge that I described? It's called Moravec's paradox. 
Moravec is, Hans Moravec was a famous robotics professor who basically described this, that anything that's rule bound, anything that you can sort of develop a system of rules and instructions for, we can automate that. So in a sense, anything that can be automated will be automated. We don't really know how to set a list of discrete rules for what your body does, right? And so it's gonna require some complex combination of coding and machine learning and robotics and sensors so that you actually, you know, the robot actually has sensors on, on the ends, right? As opposed to just sort of dumb grappling hooks and things like that. But again, let's assume that five or 10 years from now, this gets solved as well. So everything that, you know, a person can do with his or her body gets replaced. And then you get fully automated, not just Amazon fulfillment centers, right, but factories and construction sites. Right now we don't have that. You can still get a construction job. We do not have robots that can do that. There's some 3D printers and some attempts, right? So do you see the kind of worry here is that we are at this moment, which has actually been being predicted for decades, but it's actually just now seems to be happening. In fact, I, there's a, in the book, I quote a series of scientists who wrote a president of the United States warning of the oncoming, what they called the cybernetics revolution, which was going to destroy all American jobs in the next five to 10 years. And they wrote the president, they told him, you've got to develop these social programs uh, to take care of the poverty that's going to be re going to result from this. And if you read it, you think, oh, these guys wrote this maybe last week. They just sent this to President Biden. It was written in 1964, and it was sent to Lyndon Baines Johnson. In fact, it was one of the things that inspired his uh, <laughs> the Great Society programs was the cybernetics revolution in 1964. Well, it didn't happen then, but it seems to be happening now. All right, so this is the worry, is that the machines are going to take our jobs. Right now, for me, the kind of wake up call for me on this, because I've been, I've been following this stuff. In fact, I did a book way back in 2003 with a guy named Ray Kurzweil, who's the big leading transhumanist uh, that thinks we're going to upload ourselves to the internet and that, the, the whole nine yards, um, sort of thinking about this stuff. And at the time, natural language was really, really tough. Uh, but in 2011, way back in 2011, so a lot of y'all were what, in you know, the sixth grade or something. Uh, Watson beat the reigning champions at Jeopardy. Now that was an incredible achievement because if you watch Jeopardy, it requires, first of all, you know, you get the answer and you have to frame your answer in terms of a question. It might depend on a pun or some kind of subtle um, analogy or metaphor or something that you wouldn't expect a machine to be able to get, and yet Watson won. Now Watson doesn't get it. It was clear by the mistakes that Watson made that what Watson is doing is running sort of probabilities based upon words. There's no, there's no there there. Nevertheless, from the outside, Watson, this machine, beat the two players at Jeopardy. So it seems like even natural language might ultimately submit to this. All right, so do I have you sufficiently worried about this? <laughs> this is the concern. So, Think for a minute about what you're planning to do for your career. Think, is this something that's automatable? Potentially, or not at all? Have you thought, did you think when you were thinking about your major, okay, I definitely want to do something that's robot-proof, right? <laughs> I want this to be AI-proof. That's going to be a real drag if I specialize in something to get displaced by a dumb robot, you know, in 2026. That's a bummer. So I know several of you are thinking about your majors right now, right? Um, so this is the worry. Well, here's, here's the sort of basic claim, all right? A guy named Martin Ford, he wrote a book called The Rise of the Robots. It's a great book because he manages to distill the conventional wisdom on this stuff that I've tried to communicate to you uh, in one volume. So if you're gonna read one book that sort of makes the case that the robots are coming, this would definitely be the book. Here's what Ford says in this book. He says, the shift now underway will ultimately challenge one of our most basic assumptions about technology, that, increase, that uh, machines are tools that increase the productivity of workers. So what he's saying, right, is that that's an assumption we had up until now about technology, is that it just enhanced our capacity. But what he says, he says, um, instead machines themselves are turning into workers. 
So rather than supplementing our labor, they're going to replace us all together. That's the worry. All right? Now you might have guessed from my tone that this is my view of this. And so in case you forget everything else I say, I want you to remember this, all right? Our imaginations have been fired by science fiction, by Skynet and the Terminator, right? Every movie you have ever seen about robots deals with this question of what if they wake up? What if they're conscious? Maybe they are conscious, or there's gonna be a moment when Skynet comes alive. And what does it do? It nukes us all. It's like a nanosecond, and it figures that it needs to nuke us all, right? That all of our thinking has been fed by this, and that makes perfect sense in terms of literature. Can you imagine a more boring movie than three hours? No, a Netflix series of five seasons about a robot that's not conscious, right? It's just a toaster. Right? This is deadly boring. And so it's terrible literature. So of course it has to be about that. Right? And so what happens in science fiction is that what these really are about is like exploring the boundaries between man and machine. What is our technology? Are we going to replace ourselves? It's all those kinds of things. And so it's fine as long as you understand that it's, it's, it's literature, it's fiction designed to explore these things. But what's happening is that it looks like science is getting close to our science fiction. Uh, and if you get smart people at places like Oxford telling you it's going to happen, you know, it's no wonder that we all really, really, really worry about this, all right? But it's just nonsense. It's not going to happen. And I say that that strongly so that 10 years from now when it hasn't happened, if you're doubtful now, you say, I remember Jay Richards said, you know, in Stillwater 10 years ago it was going to happen, and I didn't buy it at the time, but sure enough, right, so 10 years from now maybe I'll have credibility when you see that, no, this didn't actually happen. And so economists, when they hear this, this, these kinds of discussions, it drives them absolutely crazy because the entire discussion uh, presupposes something that economists call the lump of labor myth or the lump of labor fallacy. All right, now what's the lump of labor myth? The lump of labor myth is this myth that there's this fixed amount of work to be done. Right, so you imagine an economy, like imagine all the things that need to be done, houses that need to be cleaned, the, the shelves that need to be stocked in grocery stores, the lawns that need to be mowed, all that, right? The freight containers that need to be offloaded in Long Beach that are sitting there um, because they're not working 24-7, it turns out, in <laughs> Long Beach, they have some rule against that. That's what's happening, by the way. So they're just sitting there at night in, in the port. Okay, so all that work that needs to be done, and so you say, okay, there's this finite amount of work that's being done right now. Now, what if we could get a machine that could do all of that work? Then what would happen? Well, you say, oh, well, then there would be nothing left for us to do. But that assumes that there's just a, a fixed amount of work ever to be done. That makes absolutely no sense. It's not like 5,000 years ago, was there the same amount of work to be done that there is now? No, I mean, there were no webmasters sitting around unemployed, you know, in Phoenicia <laughs> several thousand years ago. It wasn't work. There was no technology for doing that. It never had occurred to anyone. In fact, were we sitting around? I can tell you in, in 2000, I was not sitting around thinking, you know, I would love to have a smartphone uh, with a screen and it had a touch screen and these cool haptics and I could kill zombies on the airplane with it. I could also see where I am, right? I do this. But it wasn't like there was a market ahead of time for that, right? The technology exists in a sense is created and then it creates a new market and new work to be done. That's what technology does and that's what human beings developing technology do. There's not a fixed amount of work to be done. There's an amount of work being done right now. That's the lump, of, the lump of labor myth, is to say that once that's done, there's nothing left for us to do. That implies that there's, there's nothing else that we could do. But why on earth believe that? There's no reason in the world to believe that. So the, you do not want to presuppose the lump of labor myth when you're thinking about this problem. If you do, you immediately worry, right? Because yeah, if you have a job driving an Uber, and uh, let's say an autonomous Uber takes that job, what happens? Well, that individual job disappeared, but what also happens is that the cost to the economy as a whole of transportation actually just went down a little bit. 
And so there's actually now more resources available for other things. And that's what entrepreneurs do. Entrepreneurs figure out ways to allocate resources to more valued uses. And so new things, they don't just pop up, they don't just drop down from heaven. Smart entrepreneurs are constantly looking for opportunities and new things that can be done. And so the fact that one job disappears, or even an entire industry disappears, it doesn't follow that the net number of jobs long term disappears. In fact, that makes absolutely no sense at all. So don't buy the lump of labor myth. Another way of thinking about this is to think about it this way. Just look at history itself. Right? So if this argument were true, if it were true that technology could lead to long-term population-wide unemployment, why is human history not this long, depressing story of increasing unemployment? I mean, imagine it. Because every time somebody invents a technology, uh, it displaces some obsolete way of doing something. Right? But does is, is that mean that, so, you know, that, that there was full employment? I don't know, 6,000 years ago, there was full employment. There weren't that many people on the earth. And then we started having a bit more babies. And there's now 7.5 billion people. And we keep inventing technology and what? So now we're at 100% unemployment because of this? It makes no sense. Nothing like this is what happened. Let me give you a more down to earth example, just in, the, just in terms of American history. So in 1750, so prior to the Declaration of Independence and the, the, um, the Revolutionary War, uh, about between 90 and 95% of the population lived and worked on farms, either free or slave or sharecropping, or sort of working the farm but not owning it, right? So in one of those three, but almost everybody in the country was working and living on farms. All right, so agriculture, and just working their fingers to the bone and doing just well enough that we were able to feed ourselves. All right, so that's 1750, 90 to 95% of the population. 1900, 50% of the population was living and working on farms. And the population was much, much larger in 1900 than in 1750. Now, did that mean all, that suddenly we were at 50% unemployment or something like that? No. You know what it is now? Now in Oklahoma, you're gonna, you probably have a sense that there are more people working on farms if, you know, if you're in the middle part of the country, because this is where most of the farms are. But if you were to take the population of the United States, just guess in your head what percentage of the population you think lives and works on farms. Yeah, it's one to one and a half percent of the population. That is extraordinary. And we have far, far more food far more abundant and far less expensive now than it ever was. And that's the reason. That's the reason because we are so productive at farm work, right, that we've brought the cost down so that people were spending maybe 40, 50, 60% of their income on food. We now spend 10, 12, 15% of our income on food, right? It's because of this. But it doesn't lead to 99% unemployment. It led to a completely different economic stages, right? Industrialization and urbanization, which in the 20th century led to factories and to assembly lines and things like that, but that's not permanent either. See, the temptation is to think whatever's happening now, right, that's a kind of a permanent, you know, it's like a platonic form. That's the only way that work can be done. Well, that's what you would think prior to mechanization, prior to the existence of tractors. You would assume that farmers all had to be standing on their feet and using animals, right? That tractor uses auto steer. So anybody that's used, that is in a, in a large farm now is using a tractor that has auto steer and it practically runs itself. So we're just a few years away from having massive tractors, all of which are running themselves, and the farmer is sitting in his, in his living room running it from there. Right? But that's not, that, right? So in other words, we can go to half percent of the population living and working on farms. That doesn't mean there's nothing left to do. It means that we're going to do different things. Now, there's a whole other talk, right? So I wrote a whole book on this about, okay, so what is it exactly that we do? But if you knew the answer to that question, you'd be a trillionaire. If you knew, okay, 20 years from now, there are going to be a bunch of people who are going to need this particular thing, right? If, when you do, if you can do that, you're somebody like Steve Jobs who anticipated, you know, if we could really simplify the interface on computers, people might use this beyond the sort of, you know, pocket square engineer types, 
right? The kind of insight or the smartphone, again, no market for a smartphone, but once it's created, right, it, cre it creates a whole new economy, right? And so, that, so don't think that because you can't predict exactly what's going to happen in the future that there's not going to be something else for us to do. So that's, I, you know, I, without kind of getting down into the details, that's what I want you to see. All right, there's no reason to believe that the amount of work being done now or the types of work being done now are the only kinds of work that can be done. So it can absolutely be true that for a lot of the jobs that you can think of right now, they could be being done by machines 15 years from now. It simply doesn't follow that we're going to have nothing left to do. That's what does not follow. And so the temptation is either to say, well, the machines are going to do everything, so let's you know, go with it, or to be a Luddite and say, OK, let's just not have technology at all because it's going to steal the jobs and I'm just going to go back to the farm. And I have a friend that did this, by the way. His poor wife didn't know she was getting into this and <laughs> ended up off the grid. You know? And so that's, a, that's a kind of other extreme. You don't need actually either of these things. Now, remember I told you a minute ago that there's a sort of, when you're talking about these questions of automation and AI, there are philosophical assumptions in the background that have to do with a kind of a smuggling in of an assumption about the nature of the human person. Now, what is that? Well, so think about this for a minute. For something to replace something else, it would have to have everything that something else had, right? So if A can replace B, literally replace it, A has to have everything that B has. It could have more, but it has to at least have that, right? So if a machine can replace us, what does that mean about us? It means that we're no more than a machine. And in fact, this is exactly the view of the advocates of strong artificial intelligence. In fact, there's a famous robotics professor that said our brains are just machines made of meat. If we are just machines, Right? If you assume that we're the kind of blind forces of nature over long periods of time have constructed this and at some point we sort of became conscious and we're able to do stuff. Well, if that's true, right, and here we are, why couldn't we design machines that could do everything that we do? We're just machines after all, right? So that, that's sort of the end of the story. And so you can see how if you have a kind of particular materialistic understanding of the human person and you think you're just a machine, then you might ought to be worried a little bit that machines could replace us. But what if we are more than machines? Yeah, there's machine-like things that we do. Our arms are like levers and our hearts are like pumps and things like that. But if we are not ourselves machines, if we're embodied persons, I mean, first of all, we're organisms, we're not machines. Not even a housefly is a machine. A housefly is an organism that transcends any kind of simple algorithm that you'd get in a machine. Uh, now, how much more the human person, right? And so if you, a lot of the debate sort of smuggles in this assumption that we're just machines. And so this is the kind of worry when you move from regular artificial intelligence, so-called weak artificial intelligence, that's just the technology you're all dealing with right now. If you do a Google search, that's artificial intelligence. Now, none of you think that there's somebody uh, you know, in California, right, in Mountain View, California, answering your questions. You know how this thing works, basically. So no one's tempted to think that's a person. That's artificial intelligence. But the idea of strong artificial intelligence is that machines, once they get fast and powerful enough, will become conscious like we are. But again, why would you assume that? Why would you assume that this machine, it wasn't designed to do that. You don't spend any time worrying that, you know, if you get a fancy enough tractor, the thing becomes an ox, right? It's gonna become an ox, it's, that's what we're replicating. None of us think that. We know perfectly well, but for some reason we think, well, this machine though, somehow it's going to become conscious. There's no more reason to think that a computer's gonna become conscious than to think that your tractor's gonna become an ox. Just doesn't follow. It only follows if you assume we are machines that became conscious at some point, and we build machines that do things kind of like us, so why wouldn't they become conscious? So you see how basic philosophical assumptions that are usually not even argued for, they find their way into the debate, and they could sort of terrify you if you don't realize what's actually going on. Right? And I know I've sort of piled a lot on you there, and I'm not sort of solving it, but I, but I, want you to, I wanted to tell you that, because what I want you to see here, right, the last thing I'll tell you, and then we'll take some questions, is that what we are at the sort of beginning of is the emergence of what we can call the information economy. 
So we had an agrarian economy. You could sort of think of humans as hunter-gatherers, and we figured out that you could plant things and division of labor. And we had this agrarian economy that transitioned into an industrial economy and then into a service economy. And we're now in the, in the beginning of an information economy in which our information technology becomes more and more it, it sort of defining what we do. And it's not just computers, it's not just you know, integrated circuits, it's fiber optic cables, uh, it's networking capacity, uh, it's all of these things together. It's digitization in which you move from the world of molecules to the world of bits, from CDs and LPs to MP3 files, which are just digital files. That's, that's where we are. But at the heart of the information economy is information. And what is information exactly? This is a really, really weird subject. And the longer you think about it and the harder you think about it, uh, the weirder it gets. Well, again, we could spend a bunch of time on it. So let me just sort of describe it intuitively for you. I don't know how many of you have been to, uh, to Victoria in British Columbia. B B Victoria is, so British Columbia is in the sort of far northern or south a western corner of Canada, just north of Seattle. There's an island called Vancouver Island, and on the south of that island is Victoria. It's a beautiful city. You should visit it if you haven't been there. And it has an inner harbor, so it has these two natural harbors. And so you can take a ferry from Port Angeles or from Bellingham or Seattle into the Victoria Harbor, and you enter the, the, the outer harbor, but you keep going. And pretty soon you actually see houses and neighborhoods almost right up next to the ocean. And it gets so calm that when you enter the inner harbor here, you'll see this if you come in at night. That building is the provincial seat of government. Okay, so that's the, like the state capital. It's 150 yards from the ocean. So that tells you how protected this is, right? And so you enter into this area. But if you do it at night in the summer, you might not notice something that you would see if you do it, do it during the day. This is what it looks like during the day. Right, using a weird interface. You guys seeing that? So this you only see in the summer. So there's this kind of grassy hillside around the inner part of the, uh, the inner harbor. And you, if you, the first time you see it, you're not quite sure what you're seeing until you get close enough. But the second you see it, you see it. Do any of you see it? Can you tell what it is? It's right there. Anybody read that? It says, welcome to Victoria. All right? And so I try to replicate this experience so that you, because you just are sort of seeing patches of color and things like that. Then all of a sudden you see it. Now, when you see that, do you spend time doing a probability calculation that some Canada geese have flown south dropping the seeds on the way south? No, you don't. You don't entertain multiple hypotheses about what happened. You're in Victoria, <laughs> you're showing up in the summer, and you recognize that that pattern on the hillside is words and letters, right? It's information. Now, is the information in the seeds, these are begonias, by the way, that happens to be the kind of flower. Is the information that codes that message, is it in the flowers? Is it in the grass? Is it something like if you just drop seeds, they automatically form this way? No. And in fact, if that were true, if the, the seed always oriented in some particular mathematical way with the grass, you couldn't code information on it. It's only because there's this kind of freedom that information can be encoded in it. So it's embedded in matter, right? It's information, but it's not matter itself. Information is not matter or energy. It's a third thing, a tertium quid, this third thing that's a reality in the universe. Now, where does information come from? What is happening here? Information is the exclusive jurisdiction, the creative capacity exclusively of intelligent agents. So what's happening here is that a mind is communicating with another mind using a physical medium, transmitting information. That is the essence of information, is that it is created by intelligence. Right? In fact, Henry Quassler, an information theorist, says we habitually associate the creation of new information with the activity of intelligent agents. So in the information economy, so far from ultimately displacing human beings and persons who create things, it's actually uniquely suited 
for us, right? Unlike things that other kinds of economies actually that you can get animals to do most stuff. But animals don't create information in the same way, non-human animals at least, in the same way. Well, depending upon your understanding of the human person, right, this is either bizarre and perplexing or it's sort of commonsensical, right? Are humans creatures that are able to create value that was not there before, to transform the physical universe around them and to create value that was not there before, or are we just machines, right? That's the kind of perennial question. And the answer to that, which way you go, I think ultimately determines whether you worry about these things or not. Now, I don't want to tell you there's nothing to be concerned about with the information economy. There is a real challenge, but the challenge is not that all the jobs are disappearing and there's going to be nothing left for you to do. The real challenge of the information economy is the accelerating pace of change and disruption. Remember I mentioned there was an agrarian stage and then there was an industrial stage. Well, in the United States, that took about 150 years that transition, and we're still sort of at the end of it, right? Well, the transition into the information economy is happening really, really, really quickly because of Moore's Law and ver various types of exponential growth and change so that entire industries can emerge, they can be the next big thing, and then they can disappear. And so that's what you need to prepare for. But don't spend your time worrying that you're going to be replaced by smart machines. Don't panic, in other words. Just prepare for an economy in the 21st century in which the creation of new information and value is at a premium. Thank you very much. Okay, so we've got some time for uh, Q&A. Is that mic on? It's just on over there. Okay, just for there, okay. So who has a question? I, some people I was going to randomly point to and ask questions, and so I'm hoping somebody actually has a question. Yeah. Here, let me bring the mic for you. Oh, yeah, we're recording this and streaming it, so that's what we need the mic for. Okay, so you said that what we should do instead of panic is to prepare. Yes. How would you recommend preparing? How would I recommend preparing? And so... Um, if you do the book, if you do the book club, you'll find out. That's just kind of shameless. But um, essentially, my argument is this: is that there are particular features of the, that make the information economy the information economy. It's highly disruptive for one thing. It's it's exponential in its growth. Um, it involves digitization. That's the movement from molecules uh, to bits. It's ever more connected. It's hyper connected, and it's informational. And so there's virtues that uh, you allow you to optimize for that. But the kind of simple answer, if you're a college student, my advice, if you're thinking, okay, what do I major in, is cover bases. So you want general intelligence. If you are numerate and literate and articulate and punctual, all right, that's actually it. That's, that's actually, a, you, you actually, you, you, because the reality is you might tr over specialize. This is the danger is that you over specialize. Um, and so and I know people that do this. I won't mention majors of people that I talk to. They got a major in something and it turns out, oh, you need a master's. Oh, well, you need a PhD to do that. Oh, there aren't even any jobs to do this. What was I do thinking, right? And it's a cul-de-sac. And so you want to develop skills that allow you to learn new things. Right? That doesn't mean you shouldn't also specialize. So I would argue develop the general intellectual skills that will allow you maximum adaptability and then choose some particular specialty that you have a vocation in maybe for a minor. Um, now, if, because a lot of people when they first hear this, they think everybody has to be a computer engineer. That's not actually true. It's absolutely not true. Um, uh, and in fact, there's an entire, for people that aren't interested in college, there's an entire area of labor now that's re-emerging that I call in the book bespoke labor. So right, as I told you, the regular kind of industrial farms, right, are fewer and fewer people are having to do that. But in, within Washington, D.C., 20 miles outside Washington, D.C., there are 50 little organic granola farms that people are, these sort of gentleman farms where people want, are perfectly willing to spend five times as much for the eggs that they know the chickens' names, right? And they know the farm, and they go to the farmer's market. It's an, it's an emerging area. 
And the reason is that people are willing to do that because they can also go to Costco and they spend so little uh, on their food that they're willing to do that. And so um, don't think that, that you, you should either just be a generalist or a specialist. Do a little of both, but if you have to pick one or the other, develop general skills. If you know how to read, if you know how to just do basic math, and I'm telling you if you're punctual, um, you're, get, you're gonna learn this stuff, but don't expect for most of you, you are not going to do what your grandparents did, who, most of whom maybe had one or two jobs, or if they had multiple jobs, they were doing the same thing their whole career. Most of you will do five or ten different things uh, in your career. So if you knew that now, right, if you knew that, okay, I'll probably do four or five things in my career before I retire, what would you be doing now? And that's going to be different for each of you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I was really happy with like the the problem that you gave us at the end, talking about like what the real problem is, mm -hmm. not that all the jobs are going to be gone, but at the rate that technology is advancing and causing disruption. And so like what something that I was thinking of consistently throughout your your speech was that what does this mean for unskilled labor? Yeah. Because especially whenever we're considering uh, don't panic, but prepare. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes with unskilled labor positions, uh, those workers don't have the opportunity to prepare in the same way that we right. as college students do. And so sometimes the problem isn't something that they're able to avoid until it's already there. Mm -hmm. So thinking of like McDonald's workers where right. now cashiers are being replaced with um, automated uh, yeah. touch screens. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's, that is, I didn't talk to you all about that because you're mostly college students, so that's not your problem necessarily, right? But that is a problem. But that's why I talked a little bit about Moravec's paradox, uh, because if you notice, like, so the example you use would be McDonald's. I mean, so McDonald's is really specialized, right? The people, if you, some of you probably made, our, my, made my daughter work at Chick-fil-A one summer. It's a really good experience, right? And it's like you, this is what you learn to do. Um, th those are the kinds of things that are gonna be fairly easy to automate, right? But things that involve complex bodily movement that you might think of as unskilled. So for instance, being a housekeeper in a hotel, you might think, okay, that's not any, there's no special, I mean, if you know how to, you, know, you sort of clean the glass, right? And you vacuum, that's actually really hard to automate. And so those kinds of, you know, you might think of that as unskilled. Those are going to be much harder to automate than, say, fast food jobs. Uh, and then uh, the skilled professions in particular. So, you know, painting, uh, electrical work, HVAC work, those kinds of things, those will be the last jobs to be automated. Now, it doesn't mean there won't be something else, but those are going to be a much tougher nuts to crack than, you know, a lot of banking jobs that you might think of as, you know, really hard. Um, and so I, if for people that don't go to college, I encourage skilled trades because, in fact, right now, part of the problems with the supply chains is a lack of people doing skilled trade jobs, ironically. And they get, they get pay really well, too. So thank you. Question. So could you expand on Moravec's paradox just a little bit, give some specific examples? Absolutely. So, so Moravec's paradox, remember I mentioned it just briefly, it's, it's, the, it's called a paradox. Because it would, when you first think about it, you would think, well, the easy thing to create a robot to do would be the stuff that a three-year-old can do. And the hard stuff to build a machine to do would be to win at Go or to win at chess. That seems really, really hard. Well, it turns out that chess, if you can get a fast enough processor and just run through the possibilities quickly, this is how these chess machines, you know, humans don't do this. They don't run through quadrillions of choices, right? They learn patterns. But these machines, it turns out if you get a processing speed that's fast enough, you know, and you just crunch the numbers, you can win at that. But that doesn't work for sort of complex movement through three-dimensional space. Um, and so that's why it's called a paradox. So it seems like, well, the thing any three-year-old can do, it should surely be easier to automate than something that takes 30 years of training in chess to do. Um, and so that's the sort of paradox. And the reason that's important is because it means that a lot of work that you might think of as moderately unskilled, but that involves complex movement, this is not a complex movement, all right? This is easily automated. But like the stuff, I use a housekeeper example or landscaping, uh, there's just lots of complicated things that you do. And so it's never gonna make sense for a long time to, until we make robots that 
cost almost nothing. It would not make sense to have a robot that does landscaping, right? Or roof work or something like that. Uh, and so, that, so that's the irony. I'm not saying those things will never be automated. What I'm saying is if you're thinking out 30 years, um, those, will, those will be the last to fall. They, they won't be the first to fall. And it's because of this thing called Moravex paradox. But I'm willing to, you know, I don't want to rely on, some people will say, well, there'll be certain things that machines will never be able to do. I tend to think, no, we'll figure out how to do it. It's just going to be hard. I mean, if you watch these uh, Boston Dynamics robot videos on YouTube, these amazing robots, doing parkour courses now. Now what you don't see is the outtakes where they totally crash, right? But the fact that they can do it tells me, yeah, we'll get machines that can do this. But you don't have a $50 million robot to do landscaping. That doesn't make sense. Great talk. Uh, but so I cannot help but wonder uh, when you say that you know, like an industry, an entire industry merges, uh, you know, then it's subsided, and then another one rises up. But what happens to that particular targeted population? I mean, for right. them, they are heavily invested deep down when it's brought down, and yeah. for most of them, that they they cannot come out of the depth or any of that. Mm -hmm. But that particular population wouldn't be able to invest in something else or right. outreach to recover from that, right? Yeah, so that's how uh, right. That's the, and that's, so, but that's why I want us to focus on, and you did, on the real problem. And so the problem there is disruption, right? It's not that yeah. there wouldn't be anything else for people to do. It's okay, what do you do if your whole life has been, say, in a factory town mm -hmm. or in a mining town? And I spend a bunch of time in the book using these examples because they're mining towns in West Virginia and Kentucky where people, you know, generations back were, were doing coal mining. Um, and most of these towns, actually, the coal mining dried up 50 years ago, but there's still people living there, right? Um, and so, and, but in my own family's history, on my mom's side, her, her dad, they, they were on a farm and they bought some land in Odessa, Texas, sight unseen. Anybody been to Odessa, Texas? So there's a lot of sand there. There's not a lot of farmland. And so they got there, it turns out there was nothing there, and so they sold it and moved to this place in the Panhandle of Texas. Somebody discovered oil later, yes, on that other land that they sold. Um, but that's sort of the story, if you look at American history, is a story of, it's, this is not a new thing now, right? There's massive disruptions that happen with farming, too, right? Most of us, right, didn't start here in Oklahoma, right? It ended up here. And so it's not like that's a news story. It's just that we've got to figure out a way uh, to help people that are in that kind of transition. Um, and so, I mean, there was a town outside where I grew up in Amarillo, Texas. There was a town called Phillips, Texas. You know why it's called Phillips? Phillips Petroleum, right? It was a refinery. It does not exist. That town ceased to exist because I think they closed the refinery or something like that. That was real disruption. But it's not, it's not fundamentally different than what's happened in the past. That's my only point. It's just that a lot of this stuff will happen more, it's gonna happen more quickly. The, that's the bad news. The good news is that new things also happen more quickly. And so what that means is if you're able to adapt, you're optimized for it. If you're not adaptable, right, like you for some reason just don't ever want to move, if you're not in the right place at the right time, that's, that's going to be tough, right? And so um, I can't solve all the problems. I'm just trying to kind of describe it to you, you know. But I think that's going to be the real social problem is how we help people make transition from say one industry or one place to the other but it's not going to be oh no there aren't going to be any jobs so you know let's all just panic we focus on the wrong thing and so what i want is for us to develop policies that actually help people rather than assuming something that's not going to happen so i know that's not satisfying but i don't have a totally satisfying answers on that it's just, it's it's an open problem Okay, so as a human development major, um, my concern is the social aspect yes. of a more integrated um, society with AI and everything like that. Um, so is there any kind of like provisions that you would have in mind mm -hmm. of how we can continue to develop our own social skills if we have more Absolutely. automated yeah. society? Yeah, I mean, and so here, this is the thing that I didn't talk about. Uh, but human beings, right, for most of history, have interacted in a particular way. And so what's happening is that our technology and our ways of interacting technologically 
move much, much more quickly than we can adapt culturally or psychologically or spiritually, frankly. Um, and so that is, I mean, I think that is a serious problem. It's not an economic problem. It's a psychological and a social problem. Um, and so the fact that people will do things on social media and say things t on Twitter, right? So I mainly hang out on Twitter. And people say awful stuff on Twitter they would never say to somebody that's ac across from them, right? And so part of this is that we have to learn, we have to, ourselves, as a matter of, of virtue forming, develop habits in which we adapt to this. And this has happened. I can remember when I was a kid, this was pre-cell phone, and I was a little kid, and there were these things called beepers. And doctors had beepers. And so if you're in church, they would beep, and they told the doctor, oh, it's an emergency, and so they'd, they'd get up, right? Um, and so they figured out, okay, that's irritating, and so make it vibrate. And the same thing with cell phones. You remember when people first, I mean, it was like 2011 and 12, no one seemed to know that you could mute their cell phone, but we've gotten better at doing that. And it's the same thing with the, our interactions on social media, is that they, all of us have got to realize, okay, this is something that requires particular discipline and virtue forming habits because it can absolutely and completely screw us up. I mean, I've got daughters and so, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna, this is a father of daughters, but I just read a study about Instagram, right, and what it does in particular to teenage girls. It's just a disaster. That's what the article, maybe it's bad for boys too, but that's what the article is about, right? But this is like stuff that is brand new. And so this is, I mean, if you're doing human development, this is something that needs to be studied. And we need to, the first thing that needs to happen is we need to figure out, okay, what, what are the costs of this? Because every technology has, usually has benefits and costs. So old people, we notice the costs and not the benefits. Young people tend to notice the benefits and not the cost. The mark of maturity is to be able to recognize the costs and the benefits and to figure out how to maximize the benefits and, and mitigate the costs. Um, but I honestly think, I, I frankly think that that social dilemma of figuring out how we interact um, using hi hyper-connected technology. I mean, so think about this. So for most of human history, people knew a few hundred people and moved, you know, within a few miles of probably where they were born. We now, a third of the human population uh, has virtually direct access at roughly the speed of light to each other, connected to one thing. This is a new moment in history. Um, and that's sort of ominous, it's sort of exciting too, uh, but I think it could honestly go either way. And I think in some ways, this is a more acute problem than the economic question that I spend my time on. Mm -hmm. So talking about the disruption, <clears throat> I'm gonna give a plug for two weeks from tonight. Uh, so I'll be uh, giving a talk about uh, universal basic income so the tentative title of my talk is The Libertarian, Conservative, Progressive, Communist, Not Socialist Case for a Universal Basic Income. <laughs> I can't imagine what that's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to show up in two weeks uh, to figure that out. Uh, it'll be at the Student Union Theater, uh, same time uh, as tonight. So I have a question for yeah. you. So you talked about information mm -hmm. as a distinguishing factor between yes. humans and machines. So my son and I, a couple years ago, were talking about machine learning and, uh, and artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, he, in his uh, senior design project at uh, college engineering, in engineering college, uh, helped develop a robot that would chase geese off of golf courses. That's great. And so he did the, the machine learning algorithm for okay. recognizing what is a goose. Yeah. So as we were talking about machine learning and artificial intelligence, we came to this uh, conclusion, which was that artificial intelligence will never truly exist until we can have a machine that can act rationally irrational. And what, and what I mean by that is a machine that can look at all the data and conclude that the data says this is the correct action or response, but I choose this as a better response in a rational way, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm going against the data. So it's kind of, I guess, a free will argument. Yeah, or, in your or say, I'm, that. Gonna, I'm just going to let the geese run. It could, it could be sin, right? <laughs> so it's like sin distinguishes us from machines, I suppose. I mean, what's really happening, in some ways, 
the word artificial intelligence is the greatest marketing coup of all time. If we had called it statistical algorithms, right, who cares? Nobody's worrying about that. But you call it artificial intelligence and you think about Skynet and Terminator and we sort of worry about this. But that's what's happening. So right, these, these machine learning algorithms, there's, they're not, it doesn't know anything. It's not conscious. There aren't thoughts that it's having about things. And so don't, don't, don't spend your time worrying about that. Spend your time worrying about the social connections that are frayed or the disruptions, especially for people that don't have a lot of options. Those are the things, those are the problems to solve. But don't worry that Skynet's gonna wake up and nuke us all. That's not anything to worry about. <laughs> Thanks so much. Good to be with you guys. So Dr. Richards will be around for uh, additional, um, if you have any follow-up questions. And we'll have a small group discussion uh, over lunch tomorrow in room 413. So if you want to carry on this uh, discussion more in depth, and then you got the book study starting on Monday uh, over lunch for the next four weeks. Thank you.